Good morning and welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Before we start, I want to confirm the commissioners who are not in the room can see and hear us. Commissioner Feldman, can you see and hear us? I can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Of course. And Commissioner Ziak, can you see and hear us? I can see and hear you. Thank you. Great. At this meeting, CPSC staff will brief the commission on a draft final rule that would establish safety standards for nursing pillows. It's almost a year ago exactly today that we were in this room being briefed on the notice of proposed rulemaking. And that day we learned about more than 150 infant deaths in nursing pillows that staff had identified over the previous decade. And they briefed us on a proposal that would preserve the functions of nursing pillows while mitigating the hazards. Pleased to be back here today to receive this briefing and to have to move forward to this step in the process. And I'm pleased the progress has happened over the past year at the voluntary standards level. A year ago, industry expressed serious reservations about a proposal. Today, we're going to hear about the progress in the ASTM subcommittee has made in developing voluntary standards that closely mirrors our staff's work. In the end, everybody was able to focus on what is most important, reducing a known risk of deaths to infants while maintaining the functionality of nursing pillows. I want to thank all the parties for the hard work in reaching this point. In a moment, I'm going to turn the uh, meeting over to the staff so they can brief us. Once they've completed this briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions of the staff with multiple rounds if necessary. As a reminder, if you have questions that address the agency's legal authority or other legal advice, please don't ask, ask at this time. We can always hold a closed executive session at the end of this briefing upon request. So briefing us today are Tim, uh, Timothy Smith, Project Manager, Director for Engineering and Sciences, and Tabby Zeb. Attorney, Regulatory Affairs Division, Office of General Counsel. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Mr. Smith and Ms. Zepp. Uh, thank you and good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Um, I apologize in advance. I'm getting over something. My voice is a little gravelly. So if it starts cutting out during this, you'll know why. Um, I'm Tim Smith, the project manager for the Nursing Pills Rulemaking Project. And as the chair mentioned today, Tabby and I will discuss TAF's dra uh, draft final rule for nursing pillows. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. Okay, today's presentation will begin with opening statements from Tabby on the underlying statutory framework for this rulemaking. Then I'll provide an overview of the product and other background information, review the incident data and hazards associated with the product, discuss the public comments staff received on the NPR and the notice of availability, and we'll discuss the status of the draft ASTM standard for nursing pillows. I will then describe the draft final rule and the potential small business impact of the rule, followed by staff's final recommendation. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Tabby, who will provide a statutory overview for this rulemaking activity. Next slide. Thank you, Tim. Um, again, I'm Tabby Zev. Um, I'm going to be discussing the statutory framework, starting with the, um, the requirements under the Administrative Procedure Act. Section 104B of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 2008, or the CPSIA, directs the Commission to initiate rulemakings to issue standards for durable infant or toddler products in accordance with the notice and comment rulemaking process under the Administrative Procedure Act, or the APA. CPSC published an NPR to initiate the rulemaking process in accordance with the APA to provide notice to the public and to receive public comments on the Commission's proposal to develop this final rule. Next slide. Section 104B1A of the CPSIA directs the Commission to consult with representatives of consumer groups, juvenile product manufacturers, and independent child product engineers and experts to examine and assess the effectiveness of any voluntary consumer product safety standards for durable infant and toddler products. If a voluntary, pro voluntary standard exists, CPSC must issue standards that are substantially the same as the relevant voluntary standard or more stringent than the voluntary standard if the commission determines that more stringent requirements would further reduce the risk of injury. If there is no voluntary standard, the commission must promulgate its own standard and continue promulgating standards for durable infant and toddler products until the CPSC has promulgated standards for all such products. This was affirmed in, in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals in 2022 in the Finbin LLC versus CPSC, where the court affirmed that the commission not only has the authority to regulate the durable infant or toddler products for which 
no voluntary standards exist, but it is required to do so by section 104B2's express st statutory command to regulate all categories of infant or toddler products. Next slide. For nursing pillows, there is no current voluntary standard in place as of today. Therefore, the requirement in section 104B to examine and assess a relevant voluntary standard does not apply at this time. However, the draft final rule assesses a draft ASTM standard for nursing pillows that is currently undergoing the ASTM approval process. The draft final rule is similar in many respects to the draft ASTM standard and staff has been actively participating in ASTM subcommittee meetings and offering feedback to ASTM's proposal for a draft voluntary standard. Next slide, over to you, Tim. Thank you, Tabby. Nursing pillows are infant products intended to position and support an infant during breastfeeding or bottle feeding. Examples of these products are shown in the images on this slide. These products generally rest upon or are worn by the caregiver while seated or partially reclined. Nursing pillows are most commonly C, U, or crescent shaped to fit closely around the caregiver's torso, but other designs exist. Most products are filled with synthetic batting or foam, but products filled with cotton, wool, or dried grains are also available. In addition to providing a support surface for infants, nursing pillows provide support for the caregiver by raising the infant to the desired height for nursing. This can reduce strain on the caregiver and can reduce pressure on the caregiver's abdomen by providing a space between them and the infant. Some products include a caregiver attachment which is typically a strap or belt, sometimes with a buckle, to secure the product to the caregiver's body. A few have restraints that attach the infant to the product. Some nursing pillows are marketed solely as a support for nursing or feeding. However, many are also marketed for secondary uses, such as for propping or tummy time. Many nursing pillows function as sitting or lounging aids for infants who have not yet developed the core strength to maintain a sitting position on their own. In these cases, the gen infant generally is propped up within the crescent-shaped opening where the caregiver's body would be located when the product is used for nursing. And the ends of the product curve around the infant to provide lateral or side support to the infant. Examples of these are shown on the right. Some products that originally were marketed for secondary uses like propping are no longer marketed for such use and focus instead on the nursing or feeding function. Next slide. In 1992, pursuant to the Commission's authority under the Federal Hazardous Substances Act, or FHSA, the Commission banned any article known as an infant cushion or infant pillow and any other similar, similar article that has all of the following features. It has a flexible fabric covering, is loosely filled with granular material, including but not limited to polystyrene beads or pellets, is easily flattened, is capable of conforming to the face or body of an infant, and is intended or promoted for use by children under one year of age. Next slide. However, there is an exemption to this ban for the Boston Billows nursing pillow and substantially similar nursing pillows that are designed to be used only as a nursing aid for breastfeeding mothers. Examples of products that fall under this exemption are described in the FHSA and include nursing pillows that are tubular in form, C or crescent shaped to fit around a caregiver's waist, round in circumference, and filled with granular material. Products that are subject to this exemption are included within the scope of the current rulemaking for nursing pillows and would need to comply with the final rule. The draft final rule does not alter the FHSA ban or the exemption to that ban, which would remain in place. Next slide. Staff search of the Consumer Product Safety Risk Management System and National Electronic Injury Surveillance System databases identified 154 fatal incidents reported to CPSC from January 2010 through December 2022 that are associated with nursing pillows and involve infants up to 12 months of age. Nearly all reported fatalities involved an infant six months older or younger, and almost three quarters involved an infant no more than three months old. The official cause of death in nearly all reported fatalities was asphyxia, suffocation, sudden unexpected infant death, sudden infant death syndrome, or similar. Almost all fatalities involved use of the nursing pillow for sleep. And these cases often involved additional unsafe sleep conditions, including co-sleeping or the presence of other soft bedding, such as bed pillows or blankets. 
More than 80% involved the nursing pillow being used in or on a sleep product, such as an adult bed or mattress, a crib, a portable playpen, or a bassinet. Two incidents occurred while the product was being used for nursing or feeding, but three cases did involve a nursing caregiver who fell asleep while nursing, resulting in them entrapping or overlaying the infant. Infants commonly were found with their face pressed into the nursing pillow itself or into another nearby product or surface after turning, rolling over, or rolling off the product. Some infants were found in contact with the nursing pillow, but with their neck hyperflexed and the head pressed toward their chest, or the neck hyperextended and the head tilted backward over the top of the product. Next slide. Staff also identified 88 non-fatal incidents and consumer concerns associated with nursing pillows. Many of these cases were various consumer concerns, including complaints about skin irritation from the material, a strong odor from the product, or product integrity issues, such as the filling material coming out of the product. However, staff did identify numerous cases involving the infant falling or rolling out of the product, and most of these cases involved falls from an elevated surface, such as a couch or bed. In nearly all fall-related cases, the infant was left in the product unattended. Two fall-related incidents involved the infant being carried while in the product. The incident data as a whole suggests that nursing pillows rarely pose a risk to, to infants while being actively used for nursing or feeding, and that the primary use pattern that leads to injury or death is the use of these products for lounging or sleep. The nursing pillows that pose the greatest risk are those that are intended, marketed, or designed for infant propping or lounging without the presence of a caregiver. Next slide. On September 26, 2023, the Commission issued a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, or NPR, under Section 104 of the CPSIA that proposed a mandatory consumer product safety standard for nursing pillows to address the risks of death and injury associated with these products. The proposed standard addressed the suffocation, entrapment, and fall hazards by prohibiting infant restraints, adding requirements for the strength of seams and caregiver attachments, requiring the infant support surfaces and the inner wall of the nursing pillow opening to have crib mattress-like firmness, adding an infant containment provision that reduces the likelihood that consumers will use the products for infant lounging and sleep, and that reduces the risk of head entrapment within the openings of these products, and including warning and instructional requirements that include a strongly worded on-product warning. Next slide. On April 23, 2024, CPSC published a Notice of Availability, or NOA, with a 30-day comment period that closed May 23rd. The NOA announced the availability of and sought comments from the public on the incident data relied upon for the NPR, which included 124 in-depth investigation reports, among other incident reports. The NOA also sought public comments on how the final rule for nursing pillows should address removable nursing pillow covers or slip covers. Next slide. The Commission received 129 public comments on the NPR and three public comments on the NOA. The topics addressed in these comments fell into several broad categories, including the scope of the rule, the performance requirements of the rule and their associated test methods, the marking and labeling requirements of the rule, the effective date, the small business issues, stockpiling concerns, and procedural and constitutional issues. Next slide. The draft final rule contains several modifications and clarifications in response to the public comments. The primary changes are listed here. The scope has been clarified to explain that slip covers sold on or together with a nursing pillow are considered a part of the nursing pillow and therefore are subject to the requirements of the rule. Soft infant and toddler carriers, as defined in 16 CFR Part 1226, have been added to the list of products outside the scope of the rule. The infant support surface firmness test method has been revised to specify that when selecting test locations, the edge of the test probe must not extend beyond the edge of the nursing pillow. The infant containment test method has been reordered so products with a caregiver attachment are tested first without a caregiver attachment secured, and then again with the caregiver attachment secured. The caregiver attachment strength test method has been revised to clarify that the requirement applies to all fastening methods, not just buckles and clasps. Definition of conspicuous, which is used to determine the placement of the warning, 
has been revised to mean visible to the caregiver while placing the nursing pillow on or against the caregiver's body. And the warning content has been revised to emphasize that babies have died using nursing pillows for sleep and lounging, to state explicitly that nursing pillows are for feeding only, and to reduce the warning length and the redundant messaging within the warning. Next slide. Currently, there are no US, published U.S. voluntary standards for nursing pillows. However, ASTM established an F15.16 subcommittee on nursing pillows, and staff has been working with the subcommittee to develop requirements intended to address the primary hazards associated with nursing pillows. The most recent balloted draft standard closed just over a week ago on August 16th, and all negatives received on the ballot were withdrawn. As a result, the ASTM voluntary standard will likely be approved and published in September. The ASTM standard largely aligns with the draft final rule and includes the same or equivalent requirements related to infant restraints, product firmness, infant containment, and semen caregiver attachment strength. And like the draft final rule, the ASTM standard also includes marking and labeling requirements that include a permanent and conspicuous warning that must appear on all products covered by the standard as well as requirements for instructional literature to accompany the products. Primary differences between the two are related to scope, where the draft final rule includes slipcovers sold on or together with the nursing pillow, while the ASTM standard does not mention slipcovers explicitly. And the product warning, where the ASTM standard does not include a warning statement that appears in the draft final rule, about moving the baby to an infant sleep product, such as a crib or bassinet, if the baby falls asleep or the caregiver feels drowsy. Next slide. I'll now briefly summarize staff's draft final rule. Like the NPR, the draft final rule defines nursing pillows as shown here. Any product intended, marketed, or designed to position and support an infant close to a caregiver's body while breastfeeding or bottle feeding. These products rest upon, wrap around, or are worn by a caregiver in a seated or reclined position. As mentioned before, the draft final rule clarifies that removable nursing pillow covers or slip covers that are sold on or together with the nursing pillow are considered a part of the nursing pillow and therefore are subject to the requirements of the rule. The draft final rule excludes maternity pillows, also known as pregnancy pillows, which are intended to support a pregnant adult body, adult's body during sleep or while lying down, and sling carriers, which are already required to meet CPSC's sling carrier safety standard. Also, in response to public comments, the draft final rule excludes soft infant and toddler carriers, which support an infant close to a caregiver's body and could possibly be used for nursing or bottle feeding, but are already regulated under 16 CFR Part 1226. Next slide. Like the NPR, the draft final rule includes general requirements to address the potential hazards associated with lead in paints, small parts, sharp edges or points, and the removal of components like zipper pulls and buttons that are accessible to the infant. The draft final rule also includes the same warning permanency requirements in the NPR, including the requirement to prevent free hanging labels that attach to the product at only one end of the label. Next slide. The draft final rule includes the NPR requirement that prohibits all nursing pillows from including an infant restraint system, and also includes the strength requirements in the NPR for seams and for caregiver attachments to address seam failures and similar product integrity issues. Next slide. Like the NPR, the draft final rule includes a firmness requirement that applies to each infant support surface on the nursing pillow as well as the inner wall of the nursing pillow opening. The test applies a three inch diameter hemispheric probe to three test locations on each surface. To meet the requirement, the force required to press the probe one inch into each test location must exceed 10 newtons or two and one quarter pounds, which results in product firmness that is comparable to crib mattresses. Diagrams on this slide illustrate the firmness test being applied to two surfaces of a nursing pillow. This requirement is intended to reduce the likelihood that the infant support surface or the interior opening of the nursing pillow can conform to an infant's face and pose a suffocation hazard. Next slide. The draft final rule also includes the NPR's infant containment provision 
that limits the degree to which the opening of a nursing pillow can envelop or provide side support to a young infant who is placed within its confines, thereby limiting its potential use for lounging or sleep. This provision also reduces the potential for an infant's head to become entrapped within this opening or for the product to restrict a young infant's head movements if the infant found themselves face down in the opening. The infant containment provision includes two basic requirements. First, when the, a nine inch cylindrical head probe is placed against the rearmost portion of the nursing pillow opening, the probe must extend beyond the opening of the nursing pillow. And second, the outer half of the probe shown in red in the diagrams on this slide cannot contact the inner wall of the nursing pillow opening, even when the probe is moved laterally out of the opening. If the nursing pillow includes a caregiver attachment, the two assessments are made twice, first with the caregiver attachment unsecured, and then again with the caregiver attachment secured and adjusted to its minimum length. Next slide. For the NPR, the Commission sought public comments on two requirements that the Commission had considered but did not include in the proposed rule. An airflow requirement that would allow nursing pillows that do not pass the firmness re requirement, provided that the product has airflow characteristics comparable to mesh crib liners, and a requirement for nursing pillows to have sharper, more angular edges to further discourage the product's use for lounging. Commenters on these topics generally agreed with the Commission's decision not to include these two requirements, stating that such requirements are unnecessary as the suffocation risk is addressed by the other performance requirements in the rule or are inappropriate. Next slide. Like the NPR, the draft final rule includes requirements for a prominent, strongly worded on-product warning that addresses the primary hazards associated with nursing pillows, with particular emphasis on the potentially deadly consequences of using these products for naps or sleep and of leaving infants unattended in these products. This warning is required to be visible to the caregiver while placing the product on or against themselves. The warning in the draft final rule shown in the, on this slide below the NPR warning has undergone several revisions in response to public comments. These include revising the initial sentence to emphasize that babies have died using nursing pillows for sleep or lounging to communicate that the stated hazard is not merely hypothetical, stating explicitly that nursing pillows are intended solely for feeding, revising some language for brevity and deleting some statements that communicate redundant messages, adding a line or border to separate the sleep and, and suffocation related warning content from the fall related content. The draft final rule retains the NPR's requirement for product packaging more markings and for instructional literature that must accompany nursing pillows. Next slide. As required by Section 604 of the Regulatory Flexibility Act, staff prepared a final regulatory flexibility analysis described, describing the possible economic impact of the draft final rule on small entities, including small businesses. Staff has identified more than 1,000 businesses that supply nursing pillows to the U.S. market. Most are small U.S. manufacturers, importers, or U.S. non-employer businesses, which include small handcrafters that ship from the United States. Most in-scope products on the market will require redesign to meet the requirements in the draft final rule. And these one-time redesign costs, including the cost to design warning labels and instruction manuals, Will be potentially significant for a significant or for a substantial number of small firms for the first year that the rule is effective. Next slide. For most small firms, the impact of redesign costs and ongoing third party testing costs to certify compliance with the rule is likely to be significant, meaning at least 1% of annual revenue. Many small volume handcrafters might stop selling nursing pillows. However, even relatively small volume suppliers with sales under 1,000 units per year might be able to reduce the impact of the final rule by raising prices to cover the costs of testing and redesign. A retail price increase of less than $5 could cover all testing costs and a substantial portion of the redesign costs, even for a very small supplier. The clarification in the draft final rule that so slip covers sold on or together with the nursing pillow are within the scope of the rule does not change or add to the burden estimate per company 
or the number of small entities impacted by the rule because the impact on these entities for these requirements was included in the NPR and the final rule. Changes to labeling and instructions will be necessary on nursing pillows, including their slip covers, but costs associated with marking and labeling, as well as providing instructional materials, generally are low on a per unit basis. Next slide. So based on the information presented here and in staff's draft final rule for nursing pillows federal register notice staff recommends that subject to further developments with the ASTM standard the commission publish a final rule for nursing pillows with an effective date of 180 days following publication of the final rule in the federal register i now welcome any questions you might have thank you for the briefing now we're going to turn to questions from the commissioners i'm going to start with myself um I'll try to actually touch on two different areas. You, you touched briefly on sort of where the ASTM voluntary standards process is at this point in time. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail as to what the difference is between the, the voluntary standard that is being considered and the uh, final rule are and what the differences may be? Sure. Um, yeah, as I, as I mentioned, the um, ASTM's draft standard has uh, has been validated and passed. Um, it's currently undergoing pre-publication review with ASTM, and our understanding is that the standard will be um, most likely approved on September 1st with publication soon after that, in all likelihood no later than mid-September. Um, I also want to sort of take this time to just sort of personally note that I really think this, the ASTM subcommittee has been working hard and working in good faith, and we really appreciate their efforts in developing this uh, voluntary standard that includes requirements that really are largely the same or equivalent to the draft final rule. The principal differences between the two are twofold. So the first is the slipcover issue. Um, as I mentioned, the draft final rule that um, slip covers that are sold on or together with the nursing pillow are considered a part of the nursing pillow and therefore would be subject to the requirements of the rule. The ASTM standard doesn't explicitly address slip covers one way or another. And the other one would be the warning. Uh, currently, the uh, draft final rule includes a warning statement that instructs consumers to move the baby to a infant sleep product like a crib or a bassinet if the baby falls asleep or if the caregiver starts to feel drowsy. And that was something that had been considered um, in the ASTM standard, but they chose not to include it. Um, but the remaining things being considered are the equivalent or functional equivalent to what is being proposed by staff? Yes, I would say th that all of the requirements either match exactly or are, as you put it, functionally equivalent. Even if they are addressing it in a slightly different way, it is accomplishing the exact same goal and the, the requirements would be equivalent as far as we're concerned. Thank you. Coming back to, um, you had a slide in 21, but we don't have to go back there. It's performance requirements that are not included but considered. Yes. Uh, the airflow and the angular requirement. Um, you talked briefly about them, but can you um, go into a little bit more detail as to why you, uh, the staff believes they're not necessary? Sure. So the, uh, the purpose of the airflow requirement was to allow for um, products that, if they did not pass firmness, would um, allow for sufficient airflow, which was defined as being um, uh, equivalent to a mesh crib liner. Um, the, there is already a requirement in the draft final rule and also in the ASTM voluntary standard for all products to meet a firmness requirement. And we feel like that effectively addresses the suffocation hazard. So there isn't, 
so any additional requirement like an airflow requirement would be redundant because that was only being considered if the product did not meet air firmness and there's already an intention for all products to meet the firmness requirement. Um, the angular requirement, the, the primary concern was it was unclear exactly what adequate or acceptable pass fail criteria would be for um, a product in terms of like how angular the product would need to be to effectively discourage consumers from using the product for lounging. And we felt like the uh, infant containment requirement uh, or limitation effectively addresses that issue. Um, and I think that summarizes it. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm going to turn to my colleagues now. Uh, Commissioner Feldman, did you have questions? I do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, Tim and Tabby, uh, thank thank you for the presentation today, but thank you also uh, to to your staff uh, for all of the work that's gone into this this standard. Uh, CPSC's work on the standard uh, has been uh, longstanding and ongoing, and I'm, I'm frankly I'm I'm glad that we're having this meeting today. Uh, I'm largely comfortable with what staff has proposed, uh, but I'm also encouraged to hear about the progress that ASTM has made. I'm curious to see uh, what will happen with that ASTM standard uh, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, and I appreciate, uh, Tim, your candid assessment about uh, how that subcommittee's work has proceeded. I have no further questions, but uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Trumka. Thank you, and thank you for working to solve this hazard. You know, 12 sleeping babies dying on nursing pillows a year your work's going to save those lives. So I thank you all for it. Uh, and a year ago, you put together a great proposal to solve this problem, which this commission unanimously approved moving forward. Uh, and it turns out it wasn't just us who likes it, as we're hearing this morning, industry's embraced it now too. So so great work bringing them along um, with them on the brink of finalizing what you've described as a near identical voluntary standard. Uh, so the solution seems clear to many. And I'm glad we're ready to solve this. Uh, I think um, once we see if that does move forward and exactly what it is, we'll need a little bit more detail comparing the two, especially the things you've de described as functionally equivalent. I'm going to want to make sure we can analyze those things. So I might come back to you with some questions at that point. Um, voluntary standards are typically effective immediately. Would this one be? Um, so. I'm not sure that I can speak to exactly what ASDM's policy is in terms of that, but I believe that generally there is a six month period from when the, the standard is published to when um, there, okay. it's considered um, where products would have to meet it. Although I'm, I'm reluctant to say that with any real authority. Um, well, I, I guess we'll see once answer. we get a final package there and we, we can wait on that. Um, but but focusing on the uh, the package before us today, um, I wanted to ask about one change from the NPR to the final rule, uh, and that was the one to add an instruction that when testers pick the location uh, of the firmness probe, that they shouldn't select locations where the three inch diameter probe extends beyond the edge of the product. Um, and and that does give me some pause. So I wanted to make sure I understand it because doesn't that mean they won't be able to place the center point of the probe anywhere on the outside inch and a half of any surface that they're testing? That would be accurate. And they test two surfaces that meet. You know, you've got the infant support surface and the inner wall, and that inch and a half, that's the outer inch and a half of both of those two surfaces that meet. So I mean, couldn't that create at that intersection a three inch space that's untested? I would say that it's accurate to say that would potentially create a three inch space along that that corner that wouldn't be tested. Um, however, so the, the, it was for the primary reason for it really was that in order to get a reliable measurement, we really felt like the probe needed to be um, fully on the product. Um, but also the firmness probe is designed based on the facial dimensions of a young infant. 
Um, so testing with the edge of the probe off the uh, partially off of the product would be um, analogous to an infant's face being partially off of the product. And that's just sort of an inherently unstable position that is un that an infant is unlikely to stay in long term, but also it um, creates a, a scenario where the product is really unlikely to um, envelop an infant's face um, in a way that blocks their airways in the same way as if the the their face was fully on the product. Well, I guess the, the question I have when we're talking about those two surfaces, so as it stands, we're only testing directly down on, on the top surface and, you know, directly on this. We're not doing a 45 degree angle at any corner. So if you have that rounded corner and, and the infant's face is going into that rounded corner, we're not testing that directional pressure just down and in. And so if you have that soft corner that has a three inch untested gap, I'm worried we're missing that one potentially. So if I if I could help, uh, what uh, uh, what the provision? Can you turn on your mic, please. What the uh, provision in the final rule uh, seeks to clarify is our intent was that the probe should be fully on uh, the pillow and avoid the situation where if you had sort of half the probe hanging off the pillow, you wouldn't test like that. That's not uh, that's not good test procedure. You would get uh, unreliable results and so forth. So we wanted to make sure that the probe was fully on the pillow uh, when testing the product. Uh, and as Tim notes, that also uh, addresses the situation where if the infant, uh, if half the probe was off the pillow, that would be analogous to half the infant's face being off the pillow. That wouldn't be a stable situation where the infant's mouth and nose would be fully occluded. Um, they would likely slide off or or uh, be half off the pillow and not fully occluded. And I would agree with you if I agreed that their face was only either downward pressure or inward pressure, but if they were at a, an angular pressure into that soft corner, I'm not sure we know that they'd slide off in that instance, and I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about that. Um, so it sounds like this change was made to make testing more replicatable as opposed to a safety improvement. Uh, it was made to make clear what staff was proposing. So again, staff was proposing that the probe should be fully on the pillow and not half hanging off the pillow. Let, let me ask what it would mean for the inner wall. So let's say you've got a, a pillow that's only 2.9 inches thick. Does that exempt it from inner wall testing? So um, I will say this is something that the ASTM subcommittee discussed that there might be some circumstances where the product is thin enough or there it doesn't allow for you to actually select locations um, that that would not raise that scenario you're talking about. And in that case, they had um, suggested that adding a a clarification that in those circumstances, you essentially centered the probe as well as you could in that log in that area and perform still perform the test so the test would still be performed even though it would in that specific case technically be hanging over so it would just be in those cases where you can't actually select the location that um, would meet that would keep you from being able to overhang is that explicit in the um the voluntary standard that that is up for their decision now yes i will have to double check that but i am about 95% certain that it is. Yes. Could you follow up with the language they use there? Because I think we would need to include that in a rule. I wouldn't want to leave this unstated that we want them to still test the inner wall. Yeah. So I uh, appreciate that. Um, I also have one question about our economic analysis. And, and it says that CPSC staff identified 22 small U.S. manufacturers that design nursing pillows in the U.S. and ship from U.S. address, although production may be in a foreign country. Um, can you provide how many of those 22 do we know to be manufacturing here in the U.S.? Or do we do we have a number on that? I'm going to defer to uh, our economic staff. Can, uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, five of the 22, we believe, um, do 
primary the primary of their manufacturing uh, in the U.S. Okay, so 17 of 22 have sent uh, their manufacturing jobs overseas. Which countries uh, did they send those jobs to? I, I'm sorry, sir. Can you repeat? The, there's 17 then. If five out of the 22 are here, 17 out of the 22 uh, are manufacturing abroad. So, so where are they manufacturing? Uh, we believe uh, mostly in Asia. Um, yes. Any countries in Asia specifically? I can follow up um, with okay. you. On. Uh, thank you. I, I have no further questions, but I, I will uh, end where I started. Thank you so much for your work to end this hazard. Really appreciate the contributions. Commissioner Wall. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Smith and Ms. Zeb for all your work. I echo my colleagues' uh, appreciation to you for not just this past year, for really many years that this uh, has been before the commission. So thank you very much. I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, nearly, nearly all of the reported fatalities involve infants six months or younger. Um, do you have a view on uh, what you would attribute that statistic to? Is it the physiology of the infant or is it the age of uh, users of the product, if you will? So I, I would say it's a combination of both. I mean, there, the products are primarily intended for very young uh, infants. They will be used for older infants too, but um, but the, the primary focus is on uh, newborns and very young infants. But also, um, young infants in general are just uh, physiologically more susceptible to um, suffocation. And um, so that, I'd say, is the primary reason. Okay, thank you very much on that. Um, I also wanted to ask you about the changes in the warnings. Uh, the final rule includes a revision to the definition of conspicuous to address comments expressing concerns that the original definition used, which was, quote, visible when the nursing pillow was in each manufacturer's recommended use position to a person while placing an infant into or onto the nursing pillow. Uh, and I guess comments uh, suggested that would require multiple identical warning labels on the products. So, um, uh, can you uh, explain, you know, what your thinking was in making that change and why you felt the comments were persuasive? Sure. Um, so, the original intent was to make the warning visible as you were placing the infant on the product, say, for lounging. Um, and it was worded the way it was because initially there was um, an expectation that the nursing pillows would uh, that many nursing pillows would end up being multifunctional that they would be intended for feeding but they would also be intended for lounging and that's that there would end up being requirements to address both scenarios that eventually evolved and instead the product is really now just a single function product. It's intended solely for feeding. Um, so the problem with the existing definition was that the manufacturer's intended use position, if the product is intended solely for feeding, means that the product would be worn by the caregiver. So the existing definition meant that the warning would have to be visible while the person was wearing it which means it would have to be on the, the support surface rather than in, for example, the uh, in a location on the inner wall of the opening that you could see as you were placing the infant on the product. And then if you had some products where they have these, for example, multiple so, uh, support surfaces where um, the it'll have like a pad that flips over so you can adjust the height on either side, in order for it to be visible in all of the manufacturer's intended use positions, you would have to have that exact warning on every single one of those pads that flips over so that it was visible while the person was wearing it. So that was the issue with that particular um, warning the way it was worded or the way that conspicuous was defined. So the intent was to specify that it had to be visible then um, Originally, we wanted to put it um, inside the inner wall of the product. The problem is that some nursing pillows just don't actually have an opening in that way. There are the uh, unusual or rare instances of these products where they 
don't have a, an actual caregiver opening. So instead, the intention was to say that it had to be visible as you are taking the product and putting it on yourself, because that would mean that it could either be on the support surface or it could be in that inner wall and would be visible whenever you were not only putting the product on, but also if you were going to place the infant in that space, it would end up being visible in that same location too. So the ultimate result of this is that in all likelihood, the warning for virtually all the products would end up being in that caregiver opening where you would be placing the infant while if you were intending to use it for lounging. Sorry, that's a long explanation. Okay, well, I think you got to what I was asking in terms of if the product is foreseeably misused still for lounging, yeah. uh, are you, is this going to take care of that this scenario? This will take care of that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I, I do appreciate that. And then I just have one final question um, about the um, uh, one of the comments, or actually several comments uh, uh, that uh, were included in the package. Uh, and um, there were, I think, three that uh, the package states that the National Institute of Standards and Technology submitted the comments on behalf of the Chinese government. Um, uh, I just would like you to maybe clarify that a bit. I, that was unfamiliar to me and uh, uh, from previous work. So if you could explain uh, what NIST was doing there and what uh, on behalf of the Chinese government. Sure. So my understanding was this was a Chinese government agency that essentially um, submitted the comments or sent the comments to NIST and then asked NIST to submit them to us on their behalf. Um, so they weren't comments from NIST. They essentially just delivered those comments to us. Are you familiar with that having ever occurred before? I'm personally not, no. Mr. Bonifaz? Uh Yes, we have gotten that rarely in the past. Uh, we also have provided comments back uh, to our international counterparts via NIST who handle uh, commentary versus the uh, technical barriers to trade. So I think it's just part of that process. Okay, thank you. I was not familiar with it, so uh, I appreciate the explanation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have other questions. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ziak, do you have questions? Uh, I have one additional question, but first I wanted to thank uh, Ms. Zeb and Mr. Smith and all of the staff who have worked on this, uh, as my colleagues have said, not just this past year, but over the years. I'd also like to thank the stakeholders, including those participating in the ASTM process and others who participated in the, the process generally, uh, including the 132 uh, commenters. Uh, that's a significant number of comments. Uh, so thank you all. I will have a couple of questions for the executive session. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Boyle uh, touched on uh, a question I had already on the uh, the NIST uh, comments on behalf of the Chinese uh, government. So thank you for that. Uh, last question and only question for me in this session. Uh, do we believe, given this is uh, an entirely new testing process and a new rule, that the testing labs will be prepared to meet the, the timing for these products? I believe so. This so in terms of, you know, just as a, for instance, the firmness test method, I know that test labs have already been performing that test because they have also, um, at the same time, they've been working on some kind of a standardized firmness test method for other products too. Uh, one that should be that could be applied to uh, multiple types of products and this test method for nursing pillows is based on that test method and they've already undergone um, a series of sample testing with products uh, including a prototype product that would in principle meet the requirements of uh, this draft final rule so they have already been um, been working on that in over the course of the development of this standard. Okay, great. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, no further questions on my my part. Uh, I'd like to also thank staff for all the work on this uh, for over the years. Um, 
And uh, as you just heard, Kim Trusiak has requested to close um, executive session. So at this point in time, we're going to adjourn this public portion of it and put the room in recess for five minutes as we clear the room from anyone who's not supposed to be here and reconvene for the closed executive session. So thanks again.